on time because I'm in such a good mood and talking nonsense to the guest that I nearly forgot to press the start button. Hey, my name is Van der Puchert and I'm a creative entrepreneur and you are watching the Creative Coffee Break where I get interesting people in to talk about interesting things or interesting ways to solve very difficult problems. So a few housekeeping things as we start off. Uh, first of all, um, there's a couple watching this show right now and there's a very clever person in that couple. The one is my friend. He's the less clever one. The other one is, her name is Anetka, and I just want to send a huge shout out to Anetka who passed her surgical exams today. We knew that she's hyper clever. She just proved it again today. So I just, the other thing I wanted to say is like, Anetka, you guys shouldn't be watching this. You should be out celebrating. So uh, congratulations once again. And then uh, a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, um, I'm always struggling and fighting with all the algorithms and digital stuff and trying to keep people updated of what's going on with the Creative Coffee Break. So if you want to stay in touch, know what's going on, know about this, the, the guests coming up because I've got a couple of really interesting folks lined up uh, for the next shows, um, jump to vannerpucher.com, hyphenpucher.com. There's a newsletter there. I promise I don't spam. Sign up for that. Also, as a bit of a sweetener, a couple of folks have asked me, how do I do this live streaming thing? What is the hardware? What's the software? Because, hey, we're going to talk about it today. Streaming and digital is not like we're waiting for the next normal or whatever. This is part of what's going to happen in the future. And I think we all need to get comfortable with this even though if we stumble over our own words. And then uh, something else I wanted to share with you. So I had the opportunity to speak at the F Up Night. Um, is where people get together and they talk about the mistakes they make. And maybe I can also convince uh, my guest today to do the same. Um, I initially thought it was more kind of junior folks getting together. And um, I went to the, the talk last night. You can see my photo there. I was looking really sad and depressed about my screw-ups that I shared with the team. But... What it is, is a bunch of folks who get together as a webinar. It's hosted by one of my previous guests, uh, Jens Heitland. Um, I've got the URL there at the bottom. So go there, register. Um, they're already planning the next session. So it's really interesting. You get there. There's at least two people who talk about um, things that they've done wrong within their kind of product. I mean, I was uh, uh, joined by Seth. Uh, I forgot his name now, but a surname now, but he was talking about an application that he built, and then that went wrong. And... Uh, shared a few ideas and thoughts around what he could have done better. I did the same thing with something I screwed up. And I really think through failure and understanding why failure happens, you learn a lot because we're sometimes a bit shy, especially here on LinkedIn, to talk about failure. And then the next thing I need to share is, um, yeah, books, 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 because that's something I wanted to cover before we get into the actual show. Let me swap my camera over here. Look at this bad boy. This is what my son brought to me today. But this is not a book. This is a chicken. Um, so let me get rid of uh, this little uh, picture in the way because I'm trying to be too fancy again today with all my little uh, files and nonsense. So what is what we're going to talk about today is, first of all, the Event Design Handbook. So this is written by Rul Frissen, Ruud Janssen, and Dennis Lawyer. So some of the topics that we will be covering will be in the Event Design Handbook, a lot of the process that we're going to be covering. It's an awesome book. I mean, you can see I've been labeling this thing uh, like crazy, and uh, it's something that I use all the time. And then, of course, a lot of reference will be made to experience design and experiences and the experience economy. This is by Joseph Pine II and James H. Gilmore. It's kind of the Bible of experience design. And then the other book that is really handy, and I, I've seen a lot of my event design friends and colleagues also jump towards this one, is The Power of Moments by Chip, and, Chip, uh, Chip Heath and Dan Heath. Damn it, I can't read. And this is really handy. And then finally, uh, something that I'll also share in the stream today is around designing experiences by Robert Rossman and Matthew Dearden. Um, met Matthew a couple of years ago at the College of Extraordinary Experiences. So a lot of nice things and uh, lots of research in here around the experience economy and also how that relates to what we're going to be talking about today. So today we're going to touch a little bit on events and experiences. And to help me with that, as I get all the books out of the way here, is a guy that I met a couple of years ago wearing an awesome t-shirt. I can't get that t-shirt away from him. It had a big event canvas on it, on it. But I didn't expect to meet him again. 
Um, I met him here at the, in a castle in Poland, and um, his name is Anthony Vade. He's a legend when it comes to event design. And what makes Anthony super interesting is the fact that he understands events. I mean, he can speak all the event acronyms out there. I mean, when I started getting involved in Event Design Collective and understanding how they work, there's a lot of acronyms and organi organizations and that kind of stuff. He understands that. He speaks the language. But the other thing that he does really well, and part of the stuff that I do and the knowledge that I get is I just reach out to Anthony. He understands technology. And then the thing that we geek out a lot about myself and him together is um, really around um, experience design. And uh, without further ado, Anthony Vade. Hey, Anthony. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. <laughs> Dude, so thanks so much for joining me on the stream here. Um, now, I haven't done much of a favor in your kind of introduction. I've just sent you a bunch of love letters. And, um, yeah, you like know, I didn't, even, I didn't even mention that you're Canadian because you're the first or the third Canadian person I've, like fourth actually, like really, if you have to count on the, on the show. And people are going to like think I'm a bit dodgy. But um, maybe a little bit of where you are at in the world, is kind of the stuff that you're focusing on at the moment. I mean, you know, I'm I'm happy to be another Canadian, but technically I'm also an Australian. So can I instead take the first Australian to be on this? That, or you have I don't know. South Africa and Australia. I don't know about that. That's a whole other thing. But um, I'll go for the Australian thing then. We're not talking rugby, mate. You're safe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, look, thanks for that introduction. I'm not a big fan of bios and introductions. In fact, I've been telling people with speaking engagements for the last how many years that I would rather them get up on stage and say, next up is Anthony Vade and he hates bios. But no one's <laughs> ever done that for me. Um, but no, I've, uh, I've spent the last 25 years really, uh, as you mentioned, in, in the world of events and technologies and in many respects sort of standing at the intersection of, of, of both of those areas and mindsets. And I've been watching this traffic rush past me and, and I've always thought through that, that someone or something needs to help to direct that traffic uh, so that we can ensure that there aren't traffic yeah. jams uh, or there aren't collisions. Um, and I think 2020 accelerated a lot of that for us and, and, and heightened the likelihood of there needing to be better alignment between technology and events. So it's been an interesting year exploring what are the, what are the benefits, uh, what are the detriments that have come out of this forced digital transformation and, and really take a look at the events industry and, and in, in all of its glory and, and all of its lacking and see how it reacts to this crisis that it's in and how we could perhaps design our way out of it face some of those challenges and, and, and be a bit more adaptive than we have been. The events industry has had a tendency to be a bit insular. It looks in at itself. They talk to each other, but we don't look outside to the world. So this collision that's occurred has given us the chance to connect with technology, product developers, different mindsets that the events industry hasn't really interfaced with in the past. And uh, I've seen this really interesting growth come out of, out of this uh, crisis, this, this really negative time. Uh, because the events industry has had this opportunity to see how other people see the world um, and embrace technology because they had to. They had no choice. They couldn't push it to the side. Yeah. Um, and, and it's been really interesting to, to explore that and start to get rid of that stigma that event professionals have of being a party planner. That, you know, the events are nice. Yeah, to organize the biscuits and the coffee, right? And all yeah. the logistics. That's what people sometimes think is event planning. Crazy, man. And then the, the thing is that I think we need to touch on a little bit because I, I had the book in front of and showed everybody the book, um, Vent Design Collective, because that, this is one of your recent moves, what you've done recently. You, you're now the North American director. Let's, let's, because we're going to dive into that a little bit. We're going to explore that a little bit. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that and how you fit into that picture? Yeah. So it, it's, it's a fascinating collective. So you mentioned the authors of the book, uh, Rude Janssen, Rulf Friesen, and Dennis Lara, and they, they uh, recognized many years ago uh, in the early 2010s in particular that there was no defined methodology for the event industry, for events specifically. Everybody had their own way of doing things. Uh, everybody had their own design thinking techniques or their own uh, roadmaps that they were following, but there was no real defined methodology. So they started looking around at all the other forms of design thinking, uh, visual communication tool sets, uh, business model generation, a lot of the great uh, existing design thinking products that are out there in the market. And they started borrowing ideas. And what came out of that, 
that that need to, uh, to to understand how to design events with intention and purpose and how to represent their value, that birthed the event canvas. Aha, uh -huh. aha. Uh -huh. Which was a visual communication tool, a lot along the lines of um, business model generation. If if some some of the viewers have come across that for product and uh, uh, offering development. Um, and then what happened, of course, is when you build a canvas and you build a methodology, you then need to support that to make sure that people can actually use it. So uh, by coming up with the canvas, they then had to write the book to support the canvas. Then the book obviously isn't enough to get widespread adoption. So they developed a event design certificate program that allowed event professionals to learn the methodology, use the methodology, design as a team. They could then get an internationally recognized certified event designer designation to their name that the, could uh, help them uh, obtain additional continuing education credits and give them a reason to continue on. And what happens once you have an education program, you need people to, to deliver that. So the collective was formed to allow uh, event designers to get access in their region, in their language, um, and to have a level of support as they went through their journey because it's all well and good to, to to teach a kid to ride a bike in a seminar, right? But it takes more than explaining how the wheels and pedals work uh, for, for the, that kid to become a confident rider. So in, in many respects, the collective is there not only to deliver the training, but then to support the users as they go forward in their career, applying this form of design thinking to designing events. Man, it sounds interesting. Listen, Anthony, like as, uh, and, and I know you do this for a living and you charge people, but, um and uh, you know, people do certifications and all these things. Um, would you mind just like stepping back into your into your studio and talking a little bit about just the, this high level? Why is the flow? Because I mean, also for the designers watching this, you'll get the taste and feel for design thinking as a DNA coming through. But there is a few spins or differences in the event design process. So if you like, if you don't mind, Anthony, if you can jump in there and and talk a little bit about what goes on there. Can I turn on a cool piece of technology? So yes, we're let's about. rock and roll it. All right, I'm going to show you the, uh, this, this is the OBS Bot Tiny. It's an AI enabled uh, tracking video camera. So hang on, see. hang on, hang on, it's going to happen. Hold on to your hats. We're going to get, it's going to follow me around or it will not behave itself. We'll see what comes first. Yeah, okay. that is it. So here we are. So now it's seen me and it should come with me as I come over here and it does. Excellent. It's, it's following. Yeah. So, uh, how how would you like me to approach this? I can sort of step you through each of the. Tools. I think just as a high level, maybe a, just a, like the flow, because I think if we, you know it could it could get very in depth. And the thing is, we also said we're going to do at least one of the tools that we're going to dive into a little bit. But just as a like as a flow through the like an overview, like a, a like a flyover. Gotcha. So uh, we have various different phases within the methodology that I won't get too deep into. Uh, but 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 they are all aimed at unlocking understanding. Uh, the first one that we, let me stop following me. I, I talk with my hands a lot, so it's not great <laughs> to have motion, uh, gesture traffic. Like a traffic cop. <laughs> yeah. so, so we have the stakeholder uh, alignment canvas, which is about getting to the core of who are the high impact stakeholders as it relates to that event that you're designing. Because we want to find the ones that have a high level of power and a high level of interest in the event and its outcomes. So we can hone our design efforts towards them because if you try to design for everybody, you design for nobody most of the time. We then go through over here, over here. There we go. Follow you, follow you. We then go through a series of empathy mapping systems. So people familiar with uh, product development, advertising, and marketing will know explains um, empathy map canvas product here. So we use that to understand, okay, we know who the stakeholders are. How are they behaving? What are their attitudes? What are their pains and their gains before they enter the event experience? And what do we hope for those behaviors to be after they've been through the event experience? And that, that allows us to articulate, okay, what change are we actually creating through the event? We Makes then sense. bring a lot of those elements into the event canvas, which is broken down into, in, into three sections. The bookends are a lot of that high level behavioral side of things. What is the human behaviors that occur? How do they enter? How do they exit? What are their pains? What do they hope to gain? What do they expect the event to be? And how do they measure their satisfaction against that expectation? The middle section, we start to fill in and start to understand the frame that we're working within, that we have to design within. What is the constraint 
and the boundaries that exist around the event and that stakeholder in particular. So we really investigate what is that stakeholder committing to? What do they expect in return for that commitment? What jobs do they need to get done in their daily life or at the event specifically? And, and how can this event help them achieve those jobs? And what does the event promise them? What's the gift that they are unwrapped by, by being involved in the event? And then of course, the really important stuff, what's it gonna cost? And what's the return on investment for, for, for that expense? And then the final piece of the event canvas is the hourglass section, which is the, um, which is the prototype, because we believe that events should be ever evolving prototypes. It's not a one and done scenario. They should constantly be aiming to create more positive change. So we, so we look at that prototype and we divide it into the experience journey, which will be familiar for a lot of um, UX developers. But the idea of what's all the touch points with that stakeholder from the day you decide to have the event into the weeks, months, or years after the event. And what is the instructional design? How are we uh, deploying content, experiences, and, and elements to actually change those behaviors and to action some, some leverage so that people shift their, their ways of behaving in positive ways. And we always look at, okay, if we have um, if, if we have this prototype in mind, we have experiences and we have instruction, how balanced are they? How much do they support each other? Uh, the events industry's had a bit of a challenge, especially in the conference world, for the last 20, 30 years of jam packing conferences full of instructional design. Very little experience, right? You're sitting down in a hotel ballroom with two screens with projectors and some drape and a monotonal speaker on stage. So what I love about the methodology is it gets you to really think about what are the event experiences. So we go through those steps and then we have other tools as well, like the uh, like the event delta here, which is about not only understanding the entering and exiting behavior, but getting really down to the core of those behaviors and, and understanding what is the change you know, they always say that there's five levels of why before you get to the real answer to any question. This tool helps you do it. It helps you to understand how we're going to change that behavior that we've articulated. And then most importantly, I think, how are we going to measure if we've successfully changed that behavior? Awesome. Really quick overview. Very quick, fast. I can't believe you did that so fast. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks. And I know you do it all the time, man. And also what's interesting is like you, you're kind of pushing this also into the digital world. I mean, you're, I mean, I think what's interesting about what you're doing currently is like you, you're mixing the digital, digital perspective and then the, in the physical, because we are, you have this kind of camera following you around and then also you still have the canvases on the wall. And it's kind of like a little bit of a proof that, I mean, you can still do all this in the digital realm. I mean, I know you're also pushing into mural and all these kind of things, yeah. but um, how, how has this experience been for you, like working in this in this crazy environment, in this office, and then uh, are, are you interacting with people? Are you doing training like this? Are you doing design like this? Just as interesting. Absolutely. All the above. And yet we, we, we have used digital whiteboarding in mural for years as well. We always had a hybrid model. Well, I always had a hybrid model to, to, to the design pre-pandemic as well. So I would always do portions, in particular stakeholder alignment. I often did in mural and perhaps a Zoom meeting as the first entry point for people to get into design. Um, I, we've now obviously doing it all online, but what I would do pre-pandemic is we'd do that online, then we'd come together in person, perhaps in a in a boardroom or, in, or a nicer venue if possible. We would do the stuff that's easier to get a grasp with the human centered stuff, the empathy and understanding the change and some of the framework and strength, we do that together because there's something magic that happens when you bring human beings together face to face that's a little bit harder to unlock in the digital space. Exactly. Being said, it's been, you know, it's been okay. We've been doing empathy mapping online and change and frame online too, but I, I there is an extra five, ten percent that I find you get from the in-person innovation. Um, and, and, and then we would come back and go back online after we've had that meeting and done all the empathy rounds and we would do deltas online and we would start prototyping online. So it wasn't that strange to make that jump for most of the collective, but we certainly did need to skill up and build out our kit um, and, and, and understand the role of technology so that it would, so that it can improve the output, not hinder it. Exactly. No, it makes sense. And, uh, and if, if I may, because I also made promises that we're going to do at least one uh, practical 
uh, part of the event design process. And uh, if you can talk through that, because it's actually, it's, it's, it's the beginning, it's one of the key things. It's also something that you use a lot in the initial conversation with, with, with someone who wants to do an event, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so do you want to take a look at the stakeholder alignment? Yes, yes, let's do that. Let's do that. Go there, okay. also bot. Okay. I'll bring you over here so you're a bit Oh, thank closer. you, thank you, thank you. There you go, I don't want to make you walk across the room. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. And Anthony, I need to also say something, right? Because the one thing that I've kind of realized around this whole event space is that, and I think you might touch on this with this tool, is that um, there's this kind of misperception that events is only these big things that happen. You know, it's not a festival. It's not a party. It's not a meeting in a big corporation. What is the difference between all these things? What is an event in the first place? So, and, and, you know, there can be much debate around this, but in the Event Design Collective, we hold pretty true that um, an event has a couple of things, a couple of criteria that, that, that it has to meet to be an event. Firstly, uh, it has to have multiple stakeholders um, because it's not really an event if there's one person involved. In fact, there's probably another name we can give to it, solo endeavor or something cruder. But, you know, one person doing one thing by themselves probably isn't an event. It could be, still be an experience. So we need to be careful when we interchange experience and events. The events industry got really excited with using the word experience yeah. over the last years as well. And they got a bit confused, I think. So um, what an event is needs to have more than one. So ideally a minimum of two uh, stakeholders, someone to host the event and someone to experience the event or, or participate in it. Um, and there needs to be some change that occurs in both or one of those stakeholders. They need to enter think, thinking, feeling, saying, and doing, like the empathy map tells us, things a certain way. And through that transformative experience, they, they are improved they, they, and, and they shift their behavior in some way. And I think that's a very important point, right? Because, I mean, like even for me, when it came to like meetings, because a meeting is an exp expensive damn thing. Um, and if you bring people in and you, you just look at the, the salaries around the table, you need to think about, okay, cool. Like what is the change that I want to create? What, is, what, what, what difference do I want to make when people walk out the door? Um, I mean, will the, the change happen? Who knows? But you need to have some kind of attention behind why you're putting that get together together. And we talk about change. Um, we love to talk about change over time. Um, and we like to talk about roles, uh, the, the, the role of the event one specific event as being one delta on a path to, to more change. Because it's very rare that you create an event, whether it's a massive conference, a huge product launch, or a small boardroom meeting, it's rare that that event has such a seismic impact that it changes uh, the organization completely. It can happen, but it's very rare. And sometimes that kind of revolution can be a bit disruptive or a bit disconcerting for those involved in it. So especially if you have a business or an organization and you, you aim to put out this kind of event that is gonna make seismic shifts, you actually risk a lot by doing that. So instead, it's often safer to look at one specific event as it relates to a greater change and then understand what is the role of this event in creating that greater change what is the role of this event to a future event that also incrementally adds to that greater overarching aim that that, that, that uh, business, product, brand, whatever it is, has. And then you can understand that, okay, we're gonna create an evolution of behavior change, not yeah. a revolution of behavior change, because it's more it, it's more easily accepted by people. And, and Anthony, you, like I mean, one of the things, like for you watching this, uh, one of the things that we spoke about is we're gonna talk a little bit about how our worlds, because I'm, I kind of, I mean, I've worked with Anthony, but I'm re representing like the UX service design side and he's coming from the event design side. And we wanted to kind of share ideas and thoughts. And the first thing I was thinking about when you were talking about this kind of long-term like view of things is like, I went, but I know that is like iteration, like, you know, agile kind of repetitiveness. And I, and I, and I think that's also kind of a similar way of thinking because if you think about the end state of your product, and you're only working towards the end state and you're only going to launch your product when it's like super finished, like the perfect product, you might launch that product and it's going to suck in the market. It's actually better to get to that. I mean, I can't believe I'm using all these acronyms myself now. I cringe. It's like you want to get to an MVP 
And then you want to iterate based on the response because I think the events work the same, right? Because if you over, overshoot your aim, uh, you do your first event, you see what the reaction is, and then you can also tweak the event. You know, I mean, you know, you, you want to look at where the change is, you want to drive the change, but you can see if your event actually landed, how can you tweak it and then align that again to what the response was from the audience? I mean, uh, it kind of, does it make sense or am I being crazy? No, you are bang on. But the problem, and one of the challenges we, we, we touched on, this collision that's occurred between the events industry, the tech industry, and, and really product development as well, uh, since we all went into lockdown. Part of the challenge is realizing that event professionals, for the most part, have, have built their reputation and their own self-perception on flawless execution, flawless products, seamless delivery of everything. And as we know in tech and product development, an MVP, a minimal viable product, is gonna have some bugs in it. Now, I, I argue that their events I've, have not been as flawless as they make out. I've been behind the curtain for years running shows with, with planners, and so they, they cover up a lot, but they've been forced now to understand what an MVP is, embrace the idea of, of an MVP, and look into prototyping and sort of say, okay, I will try something a bit different this year. Yeah. I will experiment. I'm gonna apply, hopefully, some process so that it's calculated risk, but they've still had to let go of that control, lockdown, don't risk anything attitude and start to experiment in the virtual space. Yeah, and I think if you if you build up enough goodwill with your audience um, and, and people see where you're coming from, and I think we all, I mean, maybe we are being a lot harsher on, on each other too, because I think what's happening is that we're also thinking that the Zoom generation, I mean, Zoom for one thing is like, I mean, if it wasn't for Zoom and some of the family members, we would have been screwed, right? But yeah. the thing is, I think people are making the mistake. I mean, I had a conversation with a client today that like he was upset that he had to use another platform. He wanted Zoom because he's comfortable with Zoom. But if you really think about Zoom, I mean, Zoom cannot be where we want to be with virtual events in the future. Like, yeah. you know, and I'm not, I don't have an answer, but Zoom is just the start. I'm like super excited about where this is going to go. Like this is going to be, I mean, the future is bright. Like anyway, like yeah. I'll get off yeah. my little soapbox. There's a, there's a Canadian virtual event company called Next Tech AR that I think on the 21st is going to roll out their first holographic style presenter. So you can pull out your device in your lounge room and put the speaker in the corner of your room to, to deliver the presentation. Jeez. Like that's how, next how, on top of it, right? That's that's where we're heading with 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 technology like that, with AI enabled cameras that follow you around yeah. and allow you to be natural in the space. Right? It's it's happening already, and it's going to continue to happen more and more and more accelerated. Um, and those that embrace this change and don't get locked into the okay, now I've learned the thing, nothing else. Yeah, are going to be the ones that evolve faster. You know, the the number of times I've had. I've had um, event planners say to me, oh, please, please don't give me anything new to try. I just, I've got too much on already. Like, okay, but there are other people who are trying things right now and have tried <laughs> more things than you have. And if you're okay with them overtaking you and being more successful than you, yeah. then fine, don't learn. But, but it's, yeah, it's interesting to see how the industry is kind of playing. And I've also seen a lot of our colleagues also moving like, like early adopters, like moving or changing the way they operate um, Miranda, for example, who just jumped into the digital space, like, like she just plunged in like crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just super interesting. The other thing though, that, but it, there's hope, there's hope yeah. because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the future holds. It's going to be magical, but you know, what's going to stay the same human centered design, man, the stuff that's behind you there. I mean, that is relevant for physical events. It's relevant for digital events. And I think sometimes we make the mistake that we have the the steps down in the actual digital event. Like, hey, yeah. yeah, we've got everybody to log in and like the cameras are okay and everything's in focus, but you don't have a strategy. So what's behind you is still relevant. It still makes sense. So um, we did talk about doing a quick stakeholder analysis because the first thing you do, like what you need to do is you need to understand who you are designing your event for, right? So, and that's right. the canvas that's on your shoulder over there. If we can take a quick look there. Let me um, just uh, let me let me let me grab some sticky notes and we can do it properly. Yeah, this is going to happen. I, I hope tomorrow's not watching. You know how she feels about uh, sticky notes. 
<laughs> this is especially for tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, what do you want to do? Do you want to? Do you want to? Let's do... let's play. I mean, th this uh, this live stream, right? When it works, is a is a is an event, right? Mm -hmm. So let's think about. Uh, let, let's experiment with. What is my who's, what's the stakeholders for this live stream? But you need a help, right? okay? Yes, um, and and perhaps the people watching it live right now can also help to contribute with this because we believe that design is a team sport, not a solo endeavor. Yeah. So uh, if you're if you're keen to play along with us, we're going to start, um, and the first step within the stakeholder alignment canvas is creating a long list of anybody who could have anything at stake around this event. So. This uh, coffee talks. Let's let's think about who's yeah. watching this, who's who's contributing to it, and let's go as broad as we can. Yeah. Can can so, you give me one straight up? So um, I'm seeing one comment here is uh, because I see his face. It's innovation guys. So people in the innovation um, business, like teaching innovation, coaching innovation. I'm going to call them innovation professionals. Yes. Okay. And then I also have. Sexy design guys. Sexy design guys. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will give you one of mine. I'm going to say, Werner, you are. Oh, yes. This one. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's obvious. <laughs> but, but no, you are a stakeholder that we need to have in mind. Interesting. As well. Yeah. Of course, also, um, we have, um, let me think about this. We have we have events people because that's also my crew, my team, my people. Um, event profs. Yeah, entrepreneurs, people starting up businesses. You know, I have I also have a few startup people in in play. Entrepreneurs and startups. Yeah. And then uh, the tool geeks, people who are interested in design methodologies, design processes. Tool geeks. Yeah. And let's do uh, UX people. They're also my my people. UX profs. Yeah. Uh, what about just random people stumbling upon it on LinkedIn? That's interesting. Yeah, I had some technical uh, technology folks jump into one once, like pro pro product manager people. That's a good one. Okay. So I'm going to put random audiences. I'm going to put technology product managers. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody's watching this, please don't hesitate to add to this. Any stakeholders, people that watch the show. And, and, and go as broad as you can. And even where we're open to segmenting at this point. Yeah. So you may ask yourself the question at this point. Okay. We said tech product managers. Are there specific tech products that we want to explore? Is there medical tech products versus, uh, you know, uh, communication device tech products, uh, app developers? Yeah. What, when, when you say that, who do you mean within that? So, now, I mean, want, people who are in the kind of MarTech, uh, marketing technology, marketing uh, apps, that kind of stuff. Because the other, other group of f folks that, that swing past sometimes is like marketing professionals. All right, let's do let's do one more and let's try and diverge. And the most mind. important one, Anthony, my yeah. my mom. Oh, Verna's mom. She is a huge fan. She's and she is I, without a doubt a fan. The only reason I agreed to be on this was the hope that she would then jump on and become a fan of me as well. So please, I I really hope. I think she know. might be sold by now. I mean, you did you do have this kind of camera that follows you around. Fantastic. I tried with okay. mine. It's like, this doesn't work. <laughs> so the next step that we're going to take, uh, and this is this is really fun when we do it online or in person. Uh, it's going to be a bit trickier to do that we're not whiteboarding digitally. Yeah. But we take all of these. Okay, and so one you, that's a stakeholder long list, right? We just we just like shot all the all the people watching this, and we we noted it down. Okay, cool. Step yeah. two. I mean, we would. We would spend a bit more time doing it. Generally, yeah. it's a, it's a five to ten minute job to create that list, and we really push the team to go deep. Like I said, let's look at going really into who these people are. Then we would, for a minute, get the team together, either digitally or in person, and we would transition this long list onto this matrix. Okay. That you see, the vertical axis 
from being very low to very high is about power. How much power do these stakeholders have to your event being successful? Um, can they pull the plug? If they don't turn up, contribute, watch, participate, comment, whatever their role may be, if they don't do those things, it doesn't happen. Yeah. It's not a successful event. So that's the power. All the way to the bottom, no power. All the way to the top, a lot of power. The horizontal axis is interest. So that is from, hey, you can put the you can put the event on and maybe I'll participate or not. Very little interest to I am so invested in this, I want to know more. And in fact, I would even like to contribute perhaps to the design, or I want updates on the daily okay. because my heart is captured and I'm part of this. So we would take these. And our aim through this process is to find out who lives in the high power, high interest quadrant. Great. Because those ones will provide a good return on investment for our focused design effort. Excellent. And then also, I mean, the, the other quadrants is not that you necessarily like ignore them, but you no. know, maybe it's like to let them know what's going on or, you know, like they're not super important. Okay. So I see you moving stuff over there. So I'm just throwing stuff up at random, but please. So what we would do in the in the impersonal digital version is we would spend a minute where the team just plots where they think it is. We don't debate it, we don't discuss it. If someone puts something somewhere you don't agree with, you just pick it up and you move it. Yeah, and this, is, this is quite interesting to see when it happens in real life because people are just moving these things all around. And we start to see the perspectives, right? We start to get an idea of of who the team members are designing with us in this exercise as well. How do they see the world? What is the perspective of the people who are going to contrib contribute to the next steps? Because that's important. There's a reason the word alignment is in the canvas, because through this exercise and after this exercise, the entire design team should all agree really on, on who those stakeholders are that they are focusing their efforts on. Um, if you haven't by that point, then you have some more work to do and maybe you need to come back. But what we find at this point, and you know, we can go through and plot these and debate them at length, but what we very often find as inexperienced teams do this is we end up with a lot of this. Or oh, everybody, like it's, we, we want everybody. Everybody is high power and high interest when reality often is that they're not as high power yeah. or interested as you think they are. The example I, I love to give, I worked with, um, with a creative team within a big organization um, and they were putting on their annual creative summit where they bring all of their animators and graphic designers together in one space to share best practice. They put this senior executive of the company as being a high impact stakeholder. And so we went through all the steps, we empathized with, with, with the senior executive, we did their frame, we presented the, the, the narrative to them and the senior executive came back to the, to, to the design team and said, hey, can we be completely honest with you? We've funded the event for years. We've seen the results from the event for years. What you do at it. We don't care. We don't really care. We trust you. So go ahead. That's design interesting. Your, yeah. Have your own event. So they had high level of power. Yes, they could shut it down. Absolutely. They could say, no, we're not giving you the funding to run the summit this year. But they had almost no interest in what actually happened in it. So they wanted to be satisfied to make sure that it, it still delivered the outcomes, but they weren't they weren't overly invested in in the details of it. So what we did is we then threw out all of that stakeholders analysis and we re and we reanalyzed one of the other ones. And as a result, we got better outcomes from it because, awesome. because they weren't designing for somebody who wasn't high high impact. So what we do when we get to this stage and we see this, this huge list of too many people to, to, to design for, we start to ask the design team, what is at its core the overarching aim of the event? Yeah, this is super important, right? Because also what I've seen before, and this is, you guys always trick because I've been in one or two of your training sessions, is that you, you always wait for people to get into a fight <laughs> because there's inevitably people gonna stand there and then start moving things around and like, hey, I, like, I don't agree, disagree. And then you usually drop, like, what is the aim of this freaking event, right? And then when you, when you map that out, things start to get really interesting. We love to, uh, you know, tread the line of comfort and discomfort the whole way through the process. Because when you, when you, when you play with people in, in that way and the team all agrees to participate in that kind of experience, it, it, it really does unlock the innovation. 
if we go safe and comfortable the whole time with no constructive uh, conflict, um, then, then you don't get to really good results. You get safe results. And safe's okay if you want very little change or very small increments of change. Most of the time we're trying to create bigger change than that. Um, it's the next step up. And part of that is pushing people a bit further than they would naturally go. And to do that, we, we, we use the emotion. So in that, in that, I disagree. I think random audiences are really important if you wanna grow your channel. I could make that argument for you and you could argue back with me, but, but Werner, what is the overarching aim of this event? Yeah. So the overarching things, like the reason I'm doing this is like we spoke about a little bit, the purpose of this is to kind of share wisdom. But the thing is, it is really about sharing interesting ways and talking to interesting people about how to solve difficult problems, right? And it doesn't matter in which segment this is or where it lies, but it's really about like solving difficult problems in interesting ways. Okay in interesting ways. So if that is our overarching aim, and my handwriting is appalling, lucky you can't see it very well on the camera. If we know that is our overarching aim, now we need to take a step back, look at what was plotted by the team, and look at it through that lens. If we know that, that the overarching aim of this event series is to share wisdom with uh, and, and interesting people who solve difficult problems in interesting ways, do the tool geeks still have that level of power and interest? Do the UX profs still have that level of power of interest and would start to move them around? Yeah, so because that's interesting. So for example, on my side, like, I mean, I love the UX people. They're my people, but they probably don't benefit so much from my, I mean, they, they might be more like, it's good to keep them uh, you know, in, 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 in the fold and, and highlight it, but they, yeah could probably be guests, they might not be impacted as much by the show, right? So, yeah. So they may have a lot of interest in what's going on in the show, but they probably don't have a lot of power around if this show happens exactly, or not. Exactly, yeah. But they would probably like to be involved. Yes. So as you see in the bottom section here, high interest, low power around the success of the event, they are the involved stakeholder. Yeah. How about if we pick one like a like, like random audience? Random audience are uh, just informed, like in low power for me. It's like, I mean, it's it's interesting to like maybe have a, but I mean, the thing is if someone, for, because I'll, I'll tell you what I, th what I think is interesting. I'm really interested in the startup slash entrepreneur people. Like I, I think they can benefit a lot from like information you're, you're handing over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and sure. without them, you know, like what is the, you know, what's kind of the, the point, you know, like the innovation people will probably also sit by the UX people. I mean, they, they'll be guests, you know, like Jens, yeah. that Jens was on here and uh, Sean and Tamara. Um, what else do we yeah. have there? Yeah. What is that? The event professionals. Whoa. I mean, they're also kind of in the, I mean, you're an event professional, so you're, uh, I, I want you involved, man. <laughs> and I think there's a ton of interest. In event, yeah. like as I mentioned, this this forced collision that's occurred has 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 made event professionals look to those who operate in user experience design and innovation in particular, because they are forced to understand those two elements right now. Yeah. In particular, innovation. How do we innovate safely? So I think, you know, I mean, I selfish me wants event profs to innovate more. So I want to put them up in the light, but they could be straddling the line between. Yeah, because I think there's an element like as a, as a, I mean, one of the parts, like I'm like, I'm giving my game away. I shouldn't do that. But one of the reasons I'm also doing these live streams personally is that I'm experimenting. I mean, I think we all like, I mean, Anthony, look at your flipping studio, man. It's like, I think a lot of us are experimenting because I mean, it's not that I want to be Mr. Livestream guy, but it's, it's, it's like, you know, to try and create events in a digital space, you need to experiment and kind of dip your toe in the water. And, and I think we're all doing that to get a better understanding of what goes into production. What does it take? You know, things break all the time. It's crazy. So, I mean, I, I would like to kind of like scoop, because I think there's a lot of people in the event space kind of doing the same thing. We, we want to learn from each other. So I think that is definitely in there. Yeah. Mm. Um, Werner's mom? Man, she's high interest, dude. Uh, but maybe they're, yeah. 
And high power, if she, if she tells me I can't do it anymore, then I have to stop. <laughs> it's true. Love you, mom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to put her next to the love heart. Yeah. Just so that she exactly. Just love. leave her there, man. She's like, she's important. Yeah. So, so what we would do at this point, now that we've got our overarching aim, everybody agrees as a team that that's the purpose of the event. That's the uh, Simon Sinek golden circle. We're at the core of the why, ideally, for yeah. the event. We've We've identified our high impact stakeholders, those that will have high power and high interest in your event. We would then take each of those that we identified and we would take them through those steps that I mentioned earlier, where we would empathize with them before, the, before they attend your event to understand their, their behaviors. And we would look at what we want their behaviors to be after they've attended your event and start to understand the framework that you have to design within. Yeah. How, how going to access it what is it going to help them actually achieve and what does it promise them and then we can get down as as, as rude jansen loves to say to the syrupy goodness the syrupy the goodness the smile in the mind the smile in the mind and the syrupy goodness right it's really and, yeah. and he's he's 100 right <laughs> because <laughs> because so often we go um we, we talk about human behavior at a very high level and we need to get to the core of human behavior to create that change so we would take each of those and we would understand their behaviors and then really, really get syrupy yeah. and good on that change in particular. Yeah, and I think that, and if you stay on that on that uh, canvas there, the the entry and exit behavior one, Mr. Mr. Osobot legend, I like this is one one part of the event design process that I find very very interesting. So I like the canvas. So the canvas has been a, it's really like I think what people do like if I if I talk about the canvas for a moment, the canvas, the event canvas itself. Dude, this is really funny shit. But anyway, <laughs> but the event canvas itself is like really a dashboard, and I think people forget that sometimes. It's a dashboard where you you note down all the elements of your event, so it's like you can really like like change things there and see what your event does. But this one, the entry and exit behavior, the delta in the middle there. So if you have your your entry behavior that you now define through all the analysis and you've designed your, or you've determined kind of what's the exit behavior, the delta is kind of a bridge. Like, how do I get there? And that's where yeah. the design happens. This, this, this is where the creativity happens. So that's for me the, one of the exciting parts of the process is that to figure out how do I get from that point to that point? And this is where you have to kind of invest yourself in it. Sorry, I'm getting lyrical, but it's like, it's really, it's really like that's the fun part of the whole process. Yeah, definitely. Or the funnest definitely. part. <laughs> and, and, and really asking the hard questions about, okay, what is driving behavior? What, what is causing these people to, to, to act the way they are? Because there's generally a surface reason to why they're acting, but there's contributing factors to those, to those behaviors that we need to understand before we can talk, like, this is the why. Why are they behaving that way? Why, how, how do we understand how they're behaving? Before we can even think about yeah. What are the mechanisms, the pieces that we're going to put into place to change and to, and, and, and to enact that? And then this stuff becomes the North Star. This is the validation spot to say, to say okay, yeah, those actions, those yeah. activations, those initiatives will create that yeah. change. We need, and this is how we're going to measure it. Yeah, because your, your creative ideas or the, the journeys and stuff that you start mapping out, you then map against the, against the bridge, against the delta. Yeah. Anthony! Right. Get over here, man. You've done a lot of work here. You've like, it's way too much. We have a, a couple of things to talk about bef before uh, before I have to say goodbye to you. Like, show show uh, show the people your little sets up there. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, I do have this space uh, laid out in um, in halves. So this half of the space that you see and you've been touring around is is the analog space. Yeah, it's all about the notes. It's all about writing on stuff. I write on the ceiling. On the roof. Seen. Because ideas go everywhere. There's something that happens with my limbic system. I don't know if it's a teenage vandal thing, but when I when I when I when I write in a book, it doesn't stick with me. The ideas don't grow. When I stick them on the wall and I walk past it every day, I I, I get I get that idea back in my head again, and it develops and it grows. So I love the analog side. It's all about the limbic system, and then and then this other side. If the camera will follow me all the way around, I'm breaking it. It's getting net. stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Arrow around. This is where the reality starts happening, like the, 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 the cockpit. Okay. And then this is my digital side. Man. So. And the thing is, 
like geeking out a little bit about the virtual thing and the reason I wanted to show there because I mean do you want to just I mean like I don't want to waste your time here because we want to talk about one or two other things but just like quickly just pointing out all the different things that you have there because there is a point to this yeah so so um I and and we, we kind of talked about this before we came on air but I tried to apply a bit of uh, a bit of the old McDonald's service area model to it that you know I want to be able to turn around and get to the fryer so I can do the fries and then turn around and flip the burgers at the same time. So there's yeah. some sort of ergonomics to how I can touch everything in, in the, the cockpit. And that's allowed me to the to be able to use my A10 switcher here, which is a very simple switching unit very to switch nice. between cameras. I have a, a nice uh, mirrorless SLR camera with a, with a lens that will give me a soft focus background. And I also have a video prompter Oh, so nice. Yeah, okay, you can do some prompting, yeah. I can actually see my script in front of me. And very importantly, I think, anyway, maintain eye contact with the people viewing. Because uh, how many how many webinars or sessions or workshops have, have you been in and the person spends all the time talking to the screen and not to the camera? And human beings love eye contact. We love being engaged. Yeah. We prefer someone staring down the barrel at us. So I've been very conscious of, of achieving that. But at the same time, I have another small camera here, which allows me to get a wider shot that's less of a eyeline shot. And I can start to bring things in, and I'll show you that when, when we switch back and I can talk to this wide angle camera. Oh man, yeah. And I can also switch in through my switcher, my laptop, which has a presentation. So great, I so I mean, you can bring in multimedia, I mean. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Anthony. And I can change over and you can see a couple of those shots so you can get the reference. Okay, we're gonna quickly do a change. There you go. Coming in. Wow, so that's look at the that. SLR. As I said, I got the wide angle shot here so I can bring in my books and talk through the pages and even show people pages within it. Nice. And then I can bring in the stakeholder alignment canvas that we just talked we to. We spoke about that, yeah. And then in, this is this is all in the same unit. I can even go. Uh, I can even do this and go. Okay, what about if we put nice picture and picture there? Yeah. And it's all within one click. I can turn stuff on and off. And, and the thing is, like, I think like the reason I wanted to uh, talk to you about that is, um, I think like there was recently a, a, a you know a report out, uh, and I think it was featured in HBR or somewhere where. They were talking about Zoom fatigue, where people were getting really tired of virtual events and and that. And I have this kind of alternative view in it because I think what's happening is that um, we go into, and I think we joked about it before, like you go into the Zoom call and then there's like a 10 million people are struggling to mute themselves and half of the people have double chins and the cameras are really terrible. And, the you know, like, uh, you know, the audio is just really crap. Um, and I think like, you know, I'm actually like, I have this daily like virtual event that I attend that talks about production and I go there every day and, and like beforehand, everybody does a, a mic check to make sure everybody's volume is proper. And the thing is, it's funny, like as soon as you start like focusing on the professionalism of the camera that you're using, your lighting, your audio, that it just changes the experience uh, of the virtual. I mean, not all of us can afford this, but there's a lot of small things that you can do to just improve that a little bit. And I think as we all start to level up, the experience is going to change a little bit for us. At the very basic and, level. And these products are getting more and more affordable, as, as all technology does over time. But when there's the need, and we've 2020 presented the need in the marketplace, so the, 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 the technology developers started to create more products for that need, and as a result, price went down. So the A10 Mini is a now a very affordable piece of hardware. Um, and many people already have GoPros or cameras at home or they, you know, their kids have devices that they could probably grab for a session here and there and plug it into their A10 yeah. and make it accessible. You can go to the extreme and do, you know, isolated recordings and 11 inputs and multiple overlays. But most people will get away with a $300, $300 $400 piece of hardware that's going to up the quality of their workshops and just general meetings. Uh, especially if they're in creativity, because the, uh, as we all know, those who work in creativity, getting people into a state of creative flow can be really challenging. Exactly. And getting them out of that state is super easy. 
all it takes is one camera that doesn't work yeah. or microphone that sounds or bad. And <laughs> someone's sounds mom shouting at the kids, you know, like. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, the step that we, like if I needed to cough now uh, with my, with my uh, audio switcher here, and I can mute myself, so instead of blowing someone's ears out with my cough. Yeah. Uh, you know, if someone does something great in the team and everybody gets really excited by stuff, I can... I can give them some, 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 some applause, yeah. you know? We can actually get some real rewards going in. Little things like that really spark the brain yeah. and get people thinking in different ways. Anthony, I've taken you and like I've been a bad interviewee. Like I'm just taking you on these journeys, right? But the, the other thing I wanted to just bring up, I mean, we've just spoken at the back there about the stakeholder alignment canvas, which I really recommend for anybody in like like starting to think a little bit about doing a little bit more focused event strategy is to grab that. The other thing is also, if I remember correctly, I'm bringing this on screen at the moment, is that you can actually go to the website, um, edco.global, to download a copy of the event design handbook or at least a, a first couple yeah, of chapters, get, right? Yes. So, so, so if you go and download, you, you can get a creative commons version of the event canvas. So you can get a PDF version of the event canvas that you can start to explore with the first 100 pages of this book that will explain to you what the canvas is and the different parts within it. And, of and, 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 and you'll also get access to all of our other program information. And, and, and if you want to explore more, that's a great first place to start. Um, and of course you can reach out to me to chat about it as well. Yeah. You're always available, man. I'll recommend people reaching out to you. The other thing is that we wanted to talk a little bit about, because the, the thing is what is interesting about event design. And I mean, it, it, I, I feel like it's a, it's a family member of, of like it, it fits under the umbrella of design thinking because it's human centric. The flows are different. I mean, in, in my world where I work, we use, if, you know, uh, empathy mapping, we might use the business model canvas in certain instances. And, you know, there is overlap, but I find that, and I don't know if you agree with this term, that a lot of the service design UX work that I've done in the past is really like focused on, and like, like Joe Pine focus or, or mentions is like, on some time, time well saved. So my job yeah. has always been like, optimize, 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 clean things up, make it easy to use where you know, there's this move towards the experience economy that focuses more on time well spent. And I feel like, events is kind of on the forefront of that. You know, if you think about the people like Disney and, and uh, you know, designing events, like we went to the extraordinary college, like events is really a focus on time well spent. And I don't know, can you riff on it a little bit and, and like some of the perspectives that you have around that? Yeah, and, and it kind of, and, and if we keep referencing the experience economy, because like you said earlier, it really is the Bible for experience designers. Like we, we, we tend, we have a tendency to live by that book because once you start designing with that mindset, the, the human-centered results that you talk about come. And, and one thing that they explore in that is the progression of economic value, uh, which kind of leads us towards understanding, okay, what is a commoditized product? What level of uh, client-centric customization comes into it as we go through the different values of that? And, and as you mentioned, experience comes in. And the analogy that, one of the analogies that's made in the book is the coffee bean. You can buy the coffee bean from the from the grower for fractions of pennies. You can buy the, the, the processed coffee at the supermarket for, for a few dollars more, and you've had the benefit of that being productized for you. You can go to the quick service cafe and get get a a you know drip coffee that doesn't taste great, but it's a little bit more expensive than buying it at the supermarket. You can go to Starbucks and pay double again to get the experience of the music. Um, and to go into a Starbucks and be a hip kid. Um, and now what they're talking about is the next level on top of experience, which, which fascinates me, and it really gets to this time well spent side of things, and that's the transformational offering. So through engaging with that product, how is your world changed in a positive way? How do you have an emotional connection to not only the experience that you had with the product, but how that product made your life better? And you'll start to see, now, if you hadn't explored this, you'll start to see now that Car commercials on TV are all about, you know, how does the soccer mom get the kids to the soccer game and how much does that improve her life? It's less about, you know, the safety of the car or how many, how many wheels and the types of tires it has. And it's more about how that car will improve your life. And the example in the book, sure, I can go to Starbucks, 
the example they make is, or you can go to um, to, to, to the uh, Plaza San Marco in Venice and, and, and uh, get an espresso there that costs you $20. Um, and you can pay to listen to the band and get a very expensive sandwich or, or gelato. I actually went to Venice to test that. I was, I was cynical. Is this really worth that extra money? Um, my, my wife, my sister-in-law and I sat down. We paid 75 euro for two cappuccinos um, and, and a, a short espresso coffee plus the $8 per head to listen to the Jeez, band. Jeez, okay. <laughs> and was it worth but, it? <laughs> well, I, I'm never going to have that experience again. Yeah. Like that the one-time experience with coffee, and I sat back and I looked at the pigeons and all the other things that happened in Venice in that space, and luckily it wasn't flooded when we were there. But I'm sitting there sipping my coffee and going, it isn't the best coffee, it's good coffee. All Italian coffee is good. But um, it's not by no means the greatest coffee I've had, ever had in my life. But when am I going to be back in this seat drinking a coffee, thinking about yeah. the experience economy, explaining the experience economy to my wife, like the, the moment that it created truly was a yeah. transformational experience that I now get to share with you in another transform transformative way as well. So. As, yeah, and the thing is like so, yeah, trans transformation can happen in, in all kinds of different ways, right? So, and the thing is like, I mean, also to contextualize this, I mean, I, I, I said to you, I wanted to share something with you and I also want to share it with the viewers is that um, and I just want to call this uh, the slide up here is, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's I mean, types of experience. And I think this is also important for event designers to keep in mind, right? So, and, you know, what kind of types of experiences do you get? So I just want to go from the top, like you have pros, prosaic experiences, which is really where you just have an experience and uh, you're not really active. You're not, you're kind of sitting back and enjoying it, right? And uh, there's not, no interaction. The next level up is mindful experiences where you kind of have to come off of autopilot, right? You have to do stuff like, and we joked the other day, like I was talking to a client where it's like e-learning or something, or, you know, perhaps some of the user experience stuff that we do is really like, you know, being mindful about how people interact. And, and I think, and I want to see how you feel about this, because I think event design starts to play into, into the next parts or i mean experiences on if you will is the memorable part because memorable is really when you start touching on emotion right you, you're tweaking someone's emotion in something and i think we've all seen like i mean you've me have been at, at the college of extraordinary experiences where there's elements of actually emotion coming in you know there's ritual there's interaction there's deep friendships that form so it becomes really memorable and then the next step up is meaningful and the interesting thing about meaningful experiences is, is actually that you uh, make this person or this person goes into an experience and then it makes or it causes them to actually um, have an insight about themselves. Like, yeah, I didn't realize this about myself. But then the thing is also a core thing of, of meaningful experiences is that it's co-created. Right. It's like it's, a, it's an engagement. And I think perhaps in event design, sometimes there's a. You know, I don't want to speak for you, Anthony, but there's sometimes something missing. And I think also in a lot of the virtual events, what happens is that there isn't like that co-creation because there's, we want engagement, but there's no real involvement in the creation process. And then finally, and we can talk a little bit about that as well. It's a transformational experience when you fundamentally change something about someone, um, you know, that experience is a, as a deep, meaningful, transformational impact on, on a human being. So I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, Anthony, have you worked in, in events where you, you touched on those elements at all? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and as you say, co-creation is key to a lot of that. And that's a pretty foreign concept in the events industry. They like to proclaim it's you know happening all the time. But reality is the structure and the systems within the events industry are not built for that. Uh, the RFP process is all about, okay, give me the perfect number and stick to that number. And as we know, with co-creation, numbers go in every direction. The price could go up, price could go down. And having that flexibility to co-create as appropriately with the right framework, of course, uh, is is pretty powerful. A lot of a lot of event professionals, in particular in the conference market, were were, were doing a lot of prosaic, sit back, passive participation. Uh, delivering of content, delivering of knowledge and information at people. And they've been trying to get more mindful and certainly more memorable uh, over the last few years. But taking that leap from memorable to meaningful is ha has been a bit of a challenge. And I think a lot of that is because there's not enough time 
team or space for that co-creation element. Exactly. Uh, and I and I, and I also think like even in the in the other design uh, spaces, right? Because I mean, like I said in the beginning, like we we focus a lot on on on. Uh, time well saved, uh, especially in my world. It's like, you know, and also when I define it and, and people watching this might want to disagree, but, you know, a lot of things about optimization and then the prose comes into play, perhaps the mindful. But the thing is, I feel like if you don't focus on the memorable and meaningful you're also mm -hmm. because there's another there's another entity involved, right? There's the business or the person or the event organizer. If you don't bring in the meaningful and memorable, you're also kind of disconnecting the organizer and the brand or the or the organization or the product from the from the um, from the participant because they don't get to spend time with the because the thing is it's not only about participants spending time with each other; they're spending time with your brand, spending time with you. So. Um, you know, how do you make that connection or make that uh, a, a memorable connection or at, at least meaningful? And it's, it's interesting, as we've been navigating, as, as we're heading towards uh, the hybrid model, so we're, we're, we're moving out of doing the virtual space because we can finally start to get face to get face to face again. And as part of that, everybody's realizing now that I can't stop digital. I need to keep the digital experiences going. And so I keep telling people, well, let's look at the industries, not in the event space that have been doing that really well and start to look at the experiences that are associated with it. And I, I, I love to make the example of uh, professional sport. Professional sport has been a hybrid event since we got televisions in our homes. And That's they've true, I never thought that. of that. Because you have the in-stadium who have one experience and they have elements of the experiences on the screen now, for sure. You have the at-home audience, but I would, and, and that's a different experience and different design parameters to it different stakeholder type. But I think what they've done so well is still keep that meaningful, emotional connection to the teams. And that doesn't come from when the people get into the stadium, that contributes. It doesn't come from when the TV channel starts broadcasting. It comes from all the moments in between that that fan connects with that, with that team, with, that, with the players, with the brand, and with all those other marketing. And all of those touch points over that life of that of that uh, participant or spectator connecting with that team, all of those contribute to why we get that group feel happening on our lounge room couch. Why do we feel euphoria when the when, when, when the, 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 the soccer player or the rugby player scores the goal or the try? It, it doesn't make sense it's that our brain is up, but it does. Yeah. Uh, and and what what events are struggling with is to is to understand that meaningful and transformational comes from more than that one touch point of the day that the, that the venue doors open and it goes after the time that the venue doors close. Yeah, and the thing is you said it right at the beginning, right? It comes back to what you said, like you were kind of riffing on this kind of the horizon, the event horizon, like like think about multiple events. And it's really like, I mean, I it's it was I'm at home in the training, but like when you the more you listen to what you're saying and how you have to actually eat, like not only think about your own, your one event because we get so stressed out about organizing this event and getting it going. I mean, even these live streams, like the, the, I stress about the single one every time, but you have to kind of just go through it and work about and work and work because over time the horizon is still far away. It's still a lot of work to do, but. Uh, we we are running way late here, mate. But I want to touch on one thing before we uh, we've, before we shut this sucker down. Um, yeah. And there's something that I wanted to go look at, but I didn't. And I noticed something interesting is is about. And I'm going to bring up the slide is about sacrifice because you 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 started talking about it a little bit, and I think it's in this one around. Um, yeah. You know, like can you just talk a little bit through that before I put my foot in my mouth here? So, so th this is another piece that I've, I've been chatting with colleagues in the industry about for, for many years. And what's put out in the experience economy is, is the idea that with any offering and any customer type, generally speaking, there is a pyramid of expectation that that customer type should have how they interact with your product. Um, and you should hone your product marketing and the way that you engage with your customers to address each of these areas. Um, first of all, the product needs to satisfy the need of the customer. Otherwise, why would they buy the product? That's the most basic level. 
Um, at the same time, they're more likely to engage with your offering and go ahead with you as the product provider if there's some sort of element of surprise in it. Surprise and delight we hear about all the time. So how can I not only be satisfied, but what's that extra extra piece that's gonna make me connect with your product and your brand because, whoa, I didn't see that coming. I get some positive uh, neurochemistry firing from that surprise. Yeah. And hopefully, if the surprise is good, that leads to a bit of suspense and a bit of excitement for what may come in the future with the offerings. If I continue to engage with you and new product updates, new service offerings or whatever it might be. So the, the, not only are we, are we satisfied, we're occasionally surprised, which gives us that immediate dopamine hit. And we're ready to stick with you and build loyalty because we want to see what's going to come next from that relationship. And the one that is very hard for people to grasp and a big struggle in the, the event space in particular is this idea of sacrifice. And what they say in the book is for every product owner, every service offerer, for every offering, there should be some element of sacrifice that that, that consumer, that, 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 that person you're engaging with makes to pick your product over the other ones that, that, that exist. And you need to pick what that sacrifice is as appropriate for your product and your customer. But it may be you are a more expensive product. So the sacrifice I'm going to make by engaging with you, knowing that I'm going to be satisfied, surprised, and I'm in suspense of what's going to come, I'm willing to pay more for that. And the pay more yeah. is also touching on like a lot of questions that are coming up at the moment. Should, should people be paying for virtual events, for example? Right? And if, yeah. you, if you reverse down this, it, it, you might find your answer because you have to kind of tick all those all those elements, right? Because, I mean, it's like both you and me, we did the Alt MBA, which was a transformational experience and it was a digital event. It's a digital event. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a fair amount involved to get a ticket into that door. There's a sacrifice to, to participate in the Alt MBA. And not only money, but time, effort. You know, you have to put in the effort and then you get the reward back because all those other three elements also comes into play, right? And, 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 these, and, and if you start to apply this pyramid and you start to look at products and offerings in the world, start to look at them and go, okay, where are they, especially the successful products, where are they satisfying me? Where are they surprising me? And where is the suspense if there is any? And once you've answered those questions, you can start to look a bit more closely at, okay, what is the sacrifice that they're asking me to make? And the most obvious one to all of us now is social media. Facebook is a great example of this. They give, they, they give me the satisfaction of connecting. They surprise me with people meeting up with people from years ago that I haven't spoken to and I get to get that serendipity catch up. I, there's a little bit of suspense. I don't know if they do suspense so well anymore. Uh, so maybe not the best example, but the sacrifice they ask you to make is to release your data to them. Yeah. So as you start to look at other products, I think you're going to find that there is there are sacrifices in there that 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 most successful products are asking you as the consumer to make, that you're probably not even that aware that they exist, yeah. but you still. And the thing is, I think like we're digressing completely here, but I think people are starting to become more and more aware of the sacrifices they're making. And I think that's going to grow even more over time because with Apple changing their privacy policies now, advertisers can't target so nicely anymore. So there's going to be different asks from the consumer and you're going to have to understand what is that sacrifice as it kind of relates to the reward that comes out of it. Um, quick, yeah. uh, quick one. I've got uh, Shauna that said she loves the sports analogy. Uh, so a good one there. And then also I have Roman here, methodology, process, communication, medium are all important, but the two of you demonstrate how important the person behind all of this is. So hat tip to Thank Roman you. there. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, uh, I want to start and wrap this up because I think we can still go for hours and hours on this, uh, Anthony. Um, the thing is, my next question would be to you is like, what's next for you from here? Like, the thing is, I know that people can come hunt down the event design collective. Um, there's all kinds of interesting things that 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 gets that gets done. Um, you know, I, I have the URL here on the screen. Um, you know, what's next? What? Well, how can people get involved with the event design collective? Um, yeah. So, so we are, uh, and with my new role um, take, taking care of the North America market, we are on a pretty rapid growth path. So we are warmly inviting people to connect with us and, and, and join, join the journey as we expand into North America. We've had a very strong presence in Europe for many years now, and, and we've realized now at the time to really get Canada and the US up to speed. So certainly visit the website, check out the resources, download the free resources. I mean, 
there's almost no barrier to entry to that. You're not making any sacrifice aside from giving us your email. Um, <laughs> but, but please check that stuff out. See what resonates with you. Um, and, and, and certainly make a note. Uh, I'm, I'm meeting with people daily because I, as, as Roman hinted at, it's the human connection that we want. So I got a bunch of robots that can take care of you on the back end and they will do their job. But if you want to have a conversation with me to dig into this stuff a bit deeper, then your first step is jump in there, download that, and just put the, put the ask out. Say, hey, Anthony, can I get 15 minutes of your time? Can I get half an hour of your time to chat about the programs and, and what they could mean for me? And I will jump in there and, and meet with you to talk through it. And I can attest to that. I've sent many uh, messages to Anthony. Hey, how does this technology work? Where can I find more of this, man? So, uh, and then I just want to say thank you. Um, I mean, we had a few hiccups here and there, but... Um, you know, I think your your bot has been a hit, and we we went way over time again, again. Okay. I can't help myself. Um, but I think with uh, with the stream, people will dip in and out um, as they will and see value. Hopefully, here. I mean, uh, with the canvases and the training and all the the conversation. So I just want to say thank you to you. Thank you for your time, and hopefully, I'll be able to convince you to come back again because I think we have a few other things to talk about. So Anthony, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Great cool. To see you. So and. Uh, there it is. Um, I know that uh, for some of my LinkedIn viewers, there's been a few problems. Uh, I apologize for that, but that's definitely the technology. LinkedIn is still in beta with their live streaming. So it's from time to time, there is a problem, but you will find this content there in short time. So uh, once again, I just want to leave you with a request. If you want to know more about what's going on in, uh, in my life and in the life of the live streaming more specifically, um, jump onto my mailing list because uh, that's also where I can let you know if something goes wrong and when something goes right. So please do that. And uh, as always, I want to thank you for jumping in here. The awesome guests um, next week, we're going to talk a little bit about career and career planning. So that's definitely going to happen. And uh, I hope that you'll join me for that. And uh, thanks for watching. Ciao.